All right, so what causes the planning fallacy? The planning fallacy is caused by, surprise, surprise, your system one. And um, your system one is tricked by something else Kahneman calls the inside view, uh, which he discusses in um, chapter, I believe, 24. Um, the inside view is uh, what Kahneman calls what you see is all there is. Um, your system one um, is has only has access to your subjective feelings of confidence, your excitement, um, your idea that you can make this perfect watermelon cake and you just go for it. Um, your system one, you just focus on this inside view and you ignore the objective facts about your situation. So what might the objective facts be? Uh, an objective fact might be that you ignore because of your system one. You've never made a cake before. You don't even know how to use an oven. Okay, so those are some objective facts. So I have a funny story about this. Um, so my ex-boyfriend uh, was super confident that he could dye my hair platinum blonde. So this is a system one failure. I can do it. How hard could it be? Um, and he was so confident about it that I believed him. So he went to the beauty supply store and bought all the stuff. And um, what did my hair end up looking like? Well, it was platinum at the roots and then like orange here and dark brown and there are pieces. It was a disaster. So um, his inside view was this, this, this overconfidence, this over optimistic view that of course I can do it. It's gonna turn out great. It's gonna be really easy. It's what you want to happen. Okay, what's the outside view? Take a step back. I've never dyed anyone's hair before. I don't know anything about hair. Just because my aunt is a hairdresser doesn't make, make me um, know how to dye hair. Okay, so um, that's an example of a planning fallacy. Okay, so the planning fallacy is caused by something called the optimism bias, which you'll hear about next time. Um, Tali Sherat uh, will talk to you. It's a TED talk on the optimism bias. So you have this inner feeling. This is how you feel inside. So if, if I could draw a picture of what your um, system one is doing and your inside view is doing right before you're about to make the planning fallacy, it's this. This is the picture. And I'd be interested for you to kind of tap in and access that and let me know if you notice yourself making the planning fallacy this semester and if you could notice how you're you feel while you're doing it. Um, this is how I feel when I'm about to make the planning fallacy. So you ignore the outside view. So that's your system two. The outside view is taking a step back. Wait a minute. I don't know anything about dying hair. Wait a minute. I've never made a cake before. That's the outside view. But you're so optimistic. You feel powerful. You feel excited. Um, that you just push aside any doubt because look, this is how you feel. Um, this optimism can make you feel really powerful. You don't want to consider the outside view because that's a bummer. So the outside view is an objective view of the facts of your case compared to others. So it considers the statistical baseline as relevant to you. I'll talk about statistical baselines in a second. And the inside view is the subjective feeling of confidence that you have about your project that leads you to ignore any sort of objective data, which is the baseline statistics. So it's a natural human tendency to do this, to favor the inside view over the outside view, uh, but it's super irrational. Um, so what do I mean by this natural human tendency? Um, some people speculate that um, the optimism bias, which feeds the planning fallacy um, had evolutionary advantages in our early ancestors. The optimism part did. And as a result, um, this optimism that creates a planning fallacy just is um, rampant and it runs rampant throughout the human population. So everybody is, um, whether you're smart, no matter how smart you are, um, it's this cognitive bias that sort of undermines um, critical thinking. So, um, um, yeah, it's a uh, something that all humans uh, are um, are prone to do. Planning fallacy and you. So here's an example of how the planning fallacy affects students in general. So in one study, researchers asked students, 
when do you think you're, you will complete your, ac your academic project? And then they ran through 50% sure, 75% sure. Uh, here, 99% sure. So when are you almost 100% sure that you will have completed your project for the semester? And no matter what students said, they said, hey, they made this estimate, I will be done two hours before the deadline. I will be due one day before the deadline. I'll be due a week before the deadline. No matter what uh, they speculated, only half the students were done when they said they would be done. So for the students who said, you know what, realistically, I'm going to be done two hours before the deadline, what happened to all those students? Well, um, half of them were done um, two hours before the deadline. The other half were done five minutes before the deadline. So even those students who were realistic uh, fell prey to the planning fallacy. Okay, so um, here's where I'm a bummer. Um, so how are you committing the planning fallacy this semester? Chances are you're overestimating how many school hours you can take on, how many work hours you can take on, you're underestimating the family obligations you can take on, how much exercise you can do, so there are people out there um, who are full-time students, four or five classes, working two jobs, three jobs, four jobs. I have a student just last week working four jobs. Another student working two jobs is also um, helping watch her baby niece. And I have a student who is planning to lose 70 pounds working um, part-time and going to school full-time. Um, she works out like four hours a day. Uh, yeah, that is just a lot. Um, and given all these obligations, you're also expecting to get A's and B's in your classes. You're expecting not to get fired at your job. In fact, you're expecting to get promoted. You are expecting not to fall asleep while you're watching your niece and let her fall in the pool. Um, God forbid. Um, and um, you think that you're going to get A's and B's in your classes on top of all that. Well, that's just what should I say? Impossible. Impossible. Um, so you're overestimating this. Um, yeah, and remember what I said about system two? Um, oh, yes, system two um, gets, takes willpower to make it work. Um, system two is your critical thinking system. When you're tired, when you're working hard, um, you can't uh, use your system to very well. So, um, so the quality, the answer is not this. The answer to how do you fix the planning fallacy is not become more organized and work harder. If you are working four jobs and you're going to, f uh, well, I have one student who's working four jobs. If you're working a bunch of jobs and you're um, um, going for time and you have a family and you're trying to lose weight, it just doesn't all fit no matter how organized you are. I've had students ask about procrastination. One reason, so there's a lot of reasons procrastination happens, but um, one reason might be the planning fallacy. So um, here's how it goes down, procrastination. So you've got something due on Monday, a test to study for, a paper to write. But it's Friday night and you think, oh, I have plenty of time to study for that test. I can go out with my friends on Friday. And then Saturday rolls around and your friends ask you to go play basketball. Oh, I have plenty of time to play basketball. Um, and then the study time gets shrunk and shrunk and shrunk until Sunday evening. Or worse, Monday morning. So um, this, inside, this feeling of optimism is the inside view and it leads you to make the planning fallacy. This, this happy feeling that of course, you know, an hour and a half right before the test is enough time. Uh, to study and get an A on the test. Okay, so how to fix planning mistakes. Um, your system two can compensate for the system one mistake. Uh, it's this, you have to take a step back, it's a bummer. Um, take a step back and think. Learn from the past. So um, part of the reason we make the planning fallacy is we're making a best case scenario, um, best case scenario prediction. As we said in the um, kitchen renovation budgets, it's a best case scenario, a scenario that doesn't include um, electrical problems, termites, etc. 
So don't just remember the times that things went well. So that's the time you got to the airport in 12 minutes. Remember the time you got stuck in traffic and took an hour to get to the airport. Again, don't remember, don't just remember the time you wrote your term paper in one night and got an A+. Plus. Remember the time you waited to the last minute and failed the test or you got a C- minus on your term paper. So um, we have a tendency to selectively remember things from our past. You remember the time you got to work in 10 minutes. Um, and you forget the time you got stuck, stuck in traffic. So um, don't just remember the times that things went well. Remember the things that went poorly as well and adjust. Here's another one. Um, we also have the tendency not to selectively remember the good in the past. We also have the tendency to make our estimates based on what we want to happen, not what um, is a realistic prediction. So uh, we think about how much money we want our vacation to take. We think about how much money you budget, how much money you want uh, your um, interview outfit to cost. Uh, I'm just coming up with things out of the blue. You're taking, you budget for how much you want uh, that meal to cost. Um, instead of really thinking through how much does it actually cost. So um, make this realistic estimate and then build in extra time or money for things to go wrong. Okay. So um, I mentioned baseline statistics. Um, so Bert Flyberg developed this procedure for helping governments to um, not waste billions of dollars and not to um, be years late and billions of dollars under um, over budget at the end of their project. So he said, look, go through these three steps. First, identify the appropriate reference class. So if you're a government in Sweden and you're building a transnational railroad that it's so many miles long, um, you're going to want to look at how much transnational railroads cost in general. That's the reference cost. Transnational railroads. Um, if you're renovating your kitchen, um, look up kit, cost of kitchen renovations in Las Vegas. If you want a new pool, cost of pools in Las Vegas. Or if you're hoping to graduate from CSN in a certain amount of time, where did you come up with that number? Two and a half years? Where did that number come from? Is it because that's how, much, how long you want it to take? Um, that's the inside view. What is the actual graduation rates for, um, or graduation time uh, for CSN? Then you obtain the statistics for your reference class. So at CSN, it takes the average student six years to graduate. Um, you're planning a wedding. You want it to cost $10,000, but what's the average cost of weddings in your area? Um, last time I looked, the average wedding in the United States cost something like twenty-five dollars to $30,000. Um, of course, you want it to, to cost $10,000, but if wishes were horses, right? Uh, you'd have a bunch of horses. So um, you're going to use the stats um, to generate a baseline prediction. So uh, years to graduation, six years, that's average. Now. You're going to use specific information about your case to adjust the baseline prediction. So six years is the average. Now, are you average? Well, of course not. You're different. We're all different. So adjust it. Um, the six years is based on um, part-time students as well. Are you a part-time student? No, you're a full-time student. You're taking five classes a semester. OK, that'll take a lot less time. Um, do you have one part-time job? Do you have two part-time jobs? Do you have a family? Oh no, you live at home with your parents and they cook for you and wash your clothes and pay your bills? Well then, um, you could lower that estimate even further and maybe you will graduate in uh, two years or two and a half years. The half year is because you couldn't get that class you needed, right? Critical thinking. Okay, uh, do you need more? Okay, so here's the summary of what we learned today. The planning fa fallacy happens everywhere, to everyone, and at every level. Chances are you're making the planning fallacy in some area of your life. The more I teach this class, the more planning fallacies I see all over my life and in my past. In my past, it'd be more helpful to see it in the present, right? But hindsight is 2020. It stems from overconfidence and optimism. It also stems from only remembering when things went really well and selectively forgetting about the times in the past when things went wrong. 
the selective forgetting is something called also called confirmation bias, which is one of the most important cognitive biases we'll study towards the end of the semester. Um, you can compensate for the planning fallacy by forcing yourself to be realistic and by thinking about all the things that can go wrong. That's a bummer, though. We have a huge motivation not to do that, a huge psychological motivation not to be a bummer to yourself. Um, but you'll save yourself a lot of grief in the long run by stepping back, using your system, too. You can also compensate for the planning fallacy by considering the outside view or the statistical base rates. Okay, this um, lecture was based on research by Daniel Kahneman in the chapter called The Outside.